<laughs> yeah. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks for having so, me. So um, I'm not sure if everybody is totally familiar with, uh, with CityGrid and, and your role within IAC. Maybe you can just spend a little bit of time sort of setting the stage with that. And then I understand you've got some news out this morning that you might want to might wanna touch on as well. So let's start there. Sure. So IAC uh, is a, effectively a publicly traded private equity firm holding largely internet-based properties. And the local division of IAC is made up of CityGrid, as well as Home Advisor. Uh, CityGrid is a local advertising network, and we have a number of owned and operated properties, including City Search, Urban Spoon, Insider Pages, and then we recently acquired a company named Felix, which is a paper call tool. So that's the, uh, that's the structure within IAC. Um, as it relates to our recent news, we actually announced today that we partnered with Kenshu. Kenshu is a, a leading edge dashboard and analytics provider, and so now effectively agencies will be able to upload and, and manage their uh, advertising spend across Google, uh, Bing, et okay. cetera, as well as the CityGrid advertising network. Okay. So we're very excited about that and uh, have high hopes for the partnerships. So um, when we were just chatting informally backstage, you made the, a very provocative remark, which was that uh, local doesn't really mean anything. So uh, how many people uh, agree with that comment? Well, uh, anyway, so could you just elaborate on that and tell us, tell the audience what you, you mean? Sure, I'll, I'll elaborate and clarify. Uh, I, for me, local is, if you say local, it's like saying a student. You have students that go to private school, public school, higher education, K through 12, preschool, et cetera. There are different segments. And the way I think about local is really it's an amalgam of a variety of different verticals. And so generally speaking, when people are attacking the local marketplace, they're doing it in a broad form, a broad approach. And I personally think that that's incredibly challenging to do effectively. I think the world is evolving more towards specialization, and I think the local advertising world will as well. Now, that, that being said, I think that there are some parties that are, that are positioned well to be effective as a kind of vertical agnostic approach. I think Facebook is one, a party, one of those parties. I think Google is one such party. I think co uh, companies that have the capability of touching hundreds of millions or billions of people have the potential scale to be able to effectively invest in a broad approach. But I think for most companies, taking a much more specific and verticalized approach is the better approach. Um, the examples in, so as an example, my old company, Seamless, uh, Seamless Web, now Seamless, is an online food ordering service. So we effectively wanted to help local restaurants to grow their business. Um, we looked at it and we said, well, we could, we, we've enabled an e-commerce platform so that people can order food uh, from local restaurants and caterers. Why don't we extend that and enable people to order, pick your other capability? And we said, you know what, let's actually just stay focused in food. And if we're the best uh, e-commerce providers in the food category, we think we'll be able to defend against an Amazon or others that over time will eventually enable purchasing in the local commerce. Another company that I was involved with, uh, which people think of as, as a healthcare company, but it's a company named ZocDoc. ZocDoc is effectively open table, but for doctors. And there again, it's a local approach, a local sales force that's required. But because of the specialized needs in the healthcare segment of HIPAA compliance, et cetera, the company was able to get an initial lead and really let, lean into that lead very aggressively. And as a result, create a differentiated offering in the marketplace. And so Open Table is another perfect example where virtually every company or virtually every category now is going to be moving into appointment booking. And Open Table has not moved beyond the restaurant segment. And part of the reason that they haven't is because from a branding standpoint, when people think of reservations, they often think of Open Table. It, within our business, we have a company, uh, Urban Spoon is one of our properties. Urban Spoon is a, a, a restaurant discovery engine. We actually have an offering that is competitive with Open Table. And so we know firsthand the challenges of, uh, of competing against a business where the brand is often associated with the entire capability. So when I, I, you know, Xerox would be another example where people say, oh, I'm going to Xerox something. It just connotes that there's a particular capability or process. So, so in any event, I think that for, the lo for people to be effective in the local marketplace, in my mind, really, uh, they need to differentiate themselves and one effective way of doing that is by taking a more verticalized approach. 
I can ask yeah. a follow-up question. Sure. Unless you want to. Yeah. yeah. So immediately that that brings to mind the sort of the industry that you're. You know, I mean, this is the local search association, a big chunk of which is is uh, Yellow Pages publishers and the related ecosystem. And what advice would you give these folks who have his, who have historically been a very broad, who were in the position of Google or Facebook in the analog world, and and have a very broad audience? How would you? tell them to manage their businesses and their strategies going forward, given what you just said. I mean, they're at a sort of a crossroads. Yeah, well, you know, it's an, with, with any disruption comes a lot of opportunity. I think that the way that I think about it is, um, and I think it's different for what I will call smaller companies that have, let's call it less than 500 salespeople versus those that have some more meaningful scale. But I think that the way that we are trying to approach things at CityGrid is to take a, a uh, more verticalized approach, but a sec instead of looking only at restaurants or, or uh, doctors, we're looking at categories where there are similarities or commonalities across different categories. So as an example, there are some industries where people want to have directions or they want to have uh, clicks. There are other verticals where they want to have phone calls and the phone calls need to meet certain criteria. And so what we are trying to do internally is to look at specific categories that have commonalities across you know, different connection types. So one of the companies that we acquired in order to pursue that is a company named Felix, which is a paper call tool. Because the way we looked at the marketplace, we said a performance-based advertising network that only provides clicks is not really gonna be competitive in what I'll call the next generation of connection types. However, I don't believe that the phone call is really ever gonna go away. Or if it is, it's gonna be quite some time from now. And so we looked and we said, well, if we want to be uh, competitive and provide quality, high quality connection types in certain categories, why don't we provide a uh, capability of, of uh, pay per call tools so that we can provide lead generation in HVAC, in what I'll call many service industries that are largely phone based. And so your local strategy really around verticals, you just talked a lot about content. Has that, has that strategy translated into your go to market approach from a sales perspective? Uh, yes and no. I would say that we're right now we're in a state of flux uh, within CityGrid. But what we are certainly doing is we're trying to move from what I'll call a middleware-oriented provider, where we're providing performance-based clicks, to a, a, bi a more bifurcated strategy, where we have at the very bottom or top of the funnel we have a presence-type product, which we, we currently have across our our various owned and operated properties. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have a much more CPA-oriented model. So that would be focusing on the specific verticals where we believe that we can provide a competitive advantage uh, insofar as we can provide a high quality ROI to our merchant advertisers and then get deeper in the, conne in the connection type. So uh, that may be an appointment, it may be helping them to manage their, uh, manage their um, customer base more effectively as a CRM tool, et cetera. That's really where we're trying to move from the middle towards one end of the spectrum or the other. And so how many verticals might you be focused on at this, at this point? Well, we are both blessed and cursed. Um, we have a legacy of thousands of merchants that we work with. And one of the challenges that we faced historically is that we tried to be all things to all people. Um, and that, that has been a challenging position, I think, for many people in the so search space. Uh, competing against Google is inherently hard. And then over time, Yelp became a very formidable competitor as well, um, bless you. Um, and and so uh, you know, I, I, what what we are now doing is we let me take a step back. Historically, what we did is we looked at our traffic and we said, okay, we have a lot of traffic in certain of our verticals in the dining space or in the nightlife space or entertainment space. Therefore, we are going to craft offerings that because that's our number one traffic category, we are going to craft offerings that cater to merchants in those categories. Mm -hmm. The challenge has been that the merchants in those categories have very viable CPA-oriented tools that they use, OpenTable, Seamless, Grubhub, et cetera. So there are transaction types that are specifically tailored to the restaurant category, and so it's very hard for a restaurant to cost-effectively um, advertise in a performance, in, in a click-based uh, model. And so historically, we were very focused on those categories because they are where our number one traffic categories. Mm -hmm. What we're now doing is we're taking a step back and saying, even if something is our third best category, 
if we believe that we actually have a tool that is providing good utility to the merchants in that category, over the long term, that is, that is more sustainable. And so we are trying to orient our business so that, um, as an example, when people go right now to City Search, the profile page or the business page that people see is, is agnostic across vertical. So if someone's a, an electrician, they see the, or if someone's searching for an electrician, they see a page. If someone's searching for a locksmith, they see a page. If someone's searching for a veterinarian, they see a page. Whereas what we are trying to do is really customize those pages so that for certain categories, maybe an appointment booking tool is important. For other categories, maybe it's driving a, a, a phone call or a connection. And we're trying to take a, an approach where we, where we no longer are tied necessarily to our historical approach of being a comprehensive directory, but we want to be both more, you know, as comprehensive as we can be, but also more focused um, and provide greater utility in a handful of verticals that we think we can be competitive. I, um, I want to follow up on, on, on two related points. One is uh, on, the, on the CPA, the A, the action, um, given that you're saying there are a variety of different types of actions depending upon the vertical, how do you price that? I mean, doesn't that introduce a lot of complexity into the pricing uh, scenario unless you're doing an auction, in which case people price it themselves, but that's probably not what's going to going to happen. So could you, could you speak to that? And then on the sales uh, side, how do you train the sales force to sell different types of actions to a lot of different verticals? It's sort of a related issue of complexity. Sure. Well, let me take the, the second one first, if I, if I may. Uh, I think that one of the, I, I think that if someone is, is uh, selling a very specialized offering, you can have what I will call a smaller sales force. I think if if someone has an offering that is trying to be uh, relevant to a broad variety of categories, given how competitive the local sales marketplace has become, I think it's very, very challenging to compete with a subscale sales force. And so one of the things that we did was many years ago, or, or three or four years ago. Um, that qualifies we, as many years in the that's internet. That's exactly <laughs> right. Um, we had both, uh, we had a very large direct sales effort. And uh, about two or three years ago, we actually began to partner more aggressively with companies that actually had their own large scale sales forces. So we've over time reduced our own direct sales force and partnered more aggressively with companies that have their own sales force. Now that can be risky. It can be certainly, you know, th there are risks in not having direct relationships with, y with your own merchants. Um, but again, we believe that from a cost viability standpoint, having a mid or smaller sales team, mid size or smaller sales team was very challenging for us given that comprehensive approach. As we start to uh, further specialize, we are going to continue to build out our capabilities in specific verticals um, because it, so, so, so in any event, that, that is kind of the, the first uh, approach that I would take, which is I think that you can be competitive in, with a smaller sales team if you take a much more focused approach but if you're trying to sell to everyone, I think that it's virtually impossible given that there are companies in the marketplace that have 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 um, salespeople such that local merchants are now being called multiple times a, a day, not just a week. Um, going to how do you actually price it, uh, depending upon how far down the acquisition funnel you get, you can price it on a dynamic basis. What I mean by that is and I'm just taking uh, an example from my previous company, we, we, people were able to order food online, and as a result, we knew exactly what they were ordering. And we knew that desserts were higher, mar tended to be higher margins. We knew that beverages tended to be higher margins. And so one of the, one of the models that we played around with was going into a, a, a restaurant, and, and not, all, uh, not all restaurants are even the same. So the margins at a sushi restaurant may be very different than the margins at a pizza restaurant or at a steakhouse. And so we effectively created, based upon the, the gross margins of different businesses, different pricing structures and tiers so that for a restaurant in a cuisine type of A, there was a fee structure of, of Z. And in a, a category of B, there was a fee structure of Y. Um, now, what, what companies that are in that same, uh, in, in industries where they're very close to the acquisition um, we're, we're almost the catalog industry, 
where you know exactly what was ordered and you know what the margins are on each individual item, it's possible to dynamically price based upon time of day. So if, some, if we drive an order to you at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night, maybe that order is more valuable to you because that's a slow time and you want more throughput, whereas you're already very busy during dinner time or during lunch time, and so you want less business. And so I believe that the, the industry will move over time to a more dynamic, um, almost yield management-esque approach to pricing their offerings. And, and I think that companies like Demand Force and others that are getting deeper into the CRM are in fact doing that. I, I know that uh, Def Supermedia and, and Yellow Book are, um, have historically priced things uh, differently for a phone call versus a map view versus a, in terms of the number of units. And so um, as an example, a merchant would buy 1,000 units a month. A phone call was worth 20 units, whereas a map view might be only worth 10. And I think that as our industry gets smarter and smarter, and as merchants get more and more sophisticated and come to demand that their service providers are more, more and more uh, sophisticated, that we will move towards some of these, some of those uh, types of pricing. You know, another thing is that historically, in order to be, uh, the, the, the l larger enterprises had a meaningful amount of resources to be able to invest in tools to really get to know their customer. So we're sitting in a casino. Um, the, the CEO of Harris is a former statistics professor at Harvard. He went in to do a consulting project. They said, we want you to build out a sophisticated loyalty program. He went in, he did a consulting project. Over time, they made him the COO, then the CEO. And he, I, I was listening to him give a presentation, he talked about how, for all intents and purposes, the casino industry is just a large loyalty program. And this, the, the nuance or the, the difference between being the best in the business and the worst in the business is knowing that when someone calls from this specific area code in this particular area of the country, immediately they get routed to operator A that knows how to sell the higher end rooms and that from, a, from a, an enticement or an engagement or retention standpoint, they're not giving the presidential suite to somebody who doesn't have meaningful amount of dollars to be able to, to, to gamble whereas they also are not offering the buffet to somebody that's a whale. And so in any event, the point is that... Um, the or, or they would become a whale if they... Right, exactly. <laughs> um, but but I, you know, I think that the broader point is that um, when you are a multi-billion dollar business like a casino, you can have loyalty capabilities that are that sophisticated. One of the great aspects of the technology area that we're, we're living in right now is that the cost to build very sophisticated tools is becoming lower and lower. And as a result, the local businesses that never before had the access to the level of sophistication of having data scientists and, and, and you know, physicists building tools just specifically for them, now that's actually, that's part of the, the, you know, the way that many of the companies in our industry operate. We have three data scientists that are looking at, um, if somebody clicks on this particular merchant What's the next click that they do, and are there ways that we can optimize that and drive greater throughput and greater efficacy and figure out which publisher provides better, better uh, conversions? And so I think that as our industry gets more and more sophisticated, um, it is going to be more and more important for, for us to specialize in the areas that we really can provide some sort of competitive differentiation. So Jason, we've got Dan Levy um, coming up later today from Facebook. You know, what's, what's your sense of the role that they're going to play in local search going forward? Um, I think that Facebook is going to be, I think that over time Facebook is going to compete with a lot of the people in this room. And I think that Facebook is incredibly well positioned to do that very effectively. And part of the reason is because, well, there are, a lot of very obvious reasons. Um, w one reason that, that I think, uh, that I, I, you know, as I've thought about it is that very often the identity of what I'll call a small business owner, you know, SMB, um, is, is their personal identity and their business identity completely overlap. So the owner of the local mm -hmm. deli yeah. is, is the owner of the local deli and you go and you have a personal relationship with them. And I think that personal relationships are the marketplace or the area that people are engaging in personal relationships are on the social networks. And so more likely than not, that local deli owner already has a Facebook profile. 
as Facebook provides more and greater tools for that person to actually advertise, it will solve a lot of the problems of self-enroll that is a challenge for the industry right mm -hmm. now. And so Google has done, has enabled self-enroll to some degree, um, but Facebook has actually enabled it completely. They just haven't necessarily extracted all the value from all the people that are on their, on their system. And so I think that they're gonna be an incredibly formidable competitor to a lot of the people in the industry. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they know, they know who all the various people, you know, they know your likes, your dislikes, et cetera. They can track and you can analyze um, w what your preferences are, how you're engaging with new media, how likely others like you are, 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 are how um, likely others similarly situated to you are engaging with certain tools, et cetera. And as they build out that tool set, I think that it's gonna be very, very powerful. And again, while that's concerning, I think that that also will create a whole host of opportunities. You know, one can look at Buddy Media as an example where um, it was a business that started, what, four years ago and was acquired by Salesforce for, I don't know what it was, $550 million or something like that. Um, so I think that there, and it, and it you know, the, the sometimes acquisition values are not, are not necessarily representative of the value in the marketplace. There are a few publicly traded companies right now in our industry that I'm somewhat surprised that they're able to sustain such a lofty value. But I think in the case of a Buddy Media, I think that one of the things that Buddy Media really tapped into is the fact that many, many of the larger agencies don't have, didn't historic, they weren't, they're, they're a little bit slower. I was actually talking with somebody previously um, who works at a very large uh, IYP, and they said that one of the challenges in, in his company is that in order for something to get introduced to the marketplace, it has to be relevant to virtually all of their customers. Mm -hmm. And that creates a lot of constraint. And as a result, there will be companies that will be disruptive. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I think the challenge for all of us is to figure out how we can disrupt ourselves, so to speak. So we're, we're really out of time here, but what's, what's one final uh, thought or piece of advice or thing that you didn't get a chance to say today that you wanna leave the audience with in the, in the final 30 seconds that we've got? I, I would just say that I think that local is, is a uh, very, it's a hot sector right now. There are a lot of people that are focused on it. No one has really cracked the code on local. I think that there are a lot of very large competitors, but I think that rather than trying to figure out ways to, to compete with some of the behemoths in the industry now, figuring out ways to partner with them or provide tools that are ne not necessarily gonna be the ones that they're gonna introduce to their marketplace is a really, will be potentially a very successful strategy going forward. We didn't get a chance to really talk about the role of social in search, social data, social signals. We didn't talk about mobile, I don't think at all. Um, but uh, you know, I wanna thank you for your very thoughtful remarks. And um, next up is uh, building the local commerce operating system, which will play off some of the things you said about cost per action and CRM. So Perfect. please uh, join me in thanking Jason. Thank you.